Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. To our audience, good evening, Team Crew Light community, or good morning if you're joining us from our guest location. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Crew Light Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the US or Australian governments. So today we're continuing our special focus on Russia and Ukraine, and we're very pleased to introduce our guest today because he's been providing a lot of very good real-time assessment. On February 15th, 2022, Major General Mick Ryan published his book, War Transformed, the Future of 21st Century Great Power Com Competition and Conflict with the Naval Institute Press. Less than two weeks later, the world was given a brutal introduction to 21st century great power warfare when Vladimir Putin's Russia invaded neighboring Ukraine. Since then, Major General Ryan has been sharing his insights and analysis of this ugly new face of modern war across social media, and we'll bring them to this episode of the Brewcast. General Ryan has commanded soldiers at the Troop, Squadron, Regiment, Task Force, and Brigade levels over the past 35 years, with operational service including deployments to East Timor, Iraq, and Southern Afghanistan. He's also served as a strategist on the United States Joint Staff in the Pentagon. He holds a bachelor's degree in Asian Studies from the University of New England, and as a graduate of the Australian Defense Force School of Languages. He is a distinguished graduate of the United States Marine Corps Command and Staff College and a graduate of the Marine Corps School of Advanced Warfighting as well. In 2012, he graduated with distinction from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He has a longstanding interest in military history and strategy, advanced technologies, organizational innovation, and adaptation theory. He was inaugural president of the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum in Australia and is a member of the Military Writers Guild. He's a keen author on the interface of military strategy, innovation, and advanced technologies, as well as how institutions can develop their own intellectual edge. He has contributed to several books, including Strategy Strikes Back, published 2018, Why We Write, published 2019, On Strategy, 2020, and To Boldly Go, released in 2021. He has also authored major reports that include the Ryan Review in 2016 and Thinking About Strategic Thinking in 2021. And the Krulak Center was also excited to include a contribution from General Ryan and his team at the Australian Defense College in volume two of our award-winning PME graphic novel series, Destination Unknown. Over the past four years, he's led a series of reforms at the Australian Defense College to adapt curriculum, academic service contracts, teacher training, international engagement, infrastructure, and learning culture for the rigors of 21st century security environment. And on 27 February, uh, General Ryan retired from the Australian Army after 35 years of continuous service. So welcome very much, sir. We appreciate your time. And although I think in your retirement, you've been fairly busy uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, especially. So I, what I what I want to do is really um, you published a book on war in the 21st century. And then two weeks later, a, a real violent war in the 21st century started. So I think for the audience, maybe at first, if you could First, just give us a background of what you were trying to capture and discuss in your book when it was published. Yeah, thanks, Ian. It's uh, it's great to be with you today and a uh, real privilege to be on uh, the broadcast. Yeah, I, I mean, I started this book a couple of years ago because I felt that the study of war as a phenomenon uh, was a really vital part of human intellectual endeavour and because it's a constant in human development. And if we want to avoid it, uh, we need to understand it. And if we can't avoid it, we need to be able to win it. So we also need to understand it. So a couple of years ago, I decided to, you know, record my thoughts, and it ended up in, as a book. I, you know, the editor at USNI Books said, "I heard you, heard you had a book," and I said, oh, "I might, I'll send it to you," and it, and it all went from there. Uh, but the other reason I wrote it, um, and that's why I'm wearing this um, sloppy Joe here, is because. Um, my career started with a massive failure at the Australian Defence Force Academy. I actually bought this top in 1987 in my only year there where I failed every subject. Um, but I was given a second chance. 
Um, and I learned that second chances are important, but I also learned that failure is a really vital part of command leadership, training and education in a military institution. And not enough military leaders talk about their failures. I mean, a senior military leader who tells you they haven't failed in their career either has taken zero risks or is not telling the truth. And more senior leaders really need to talk about their own failures, what they've learned from them, and define better what um, acceptable failure is in both an individual and collective fashion in military, military institutions. So the book is also, in some respects, learning from the failures of others and my own failures and trying to ensure that um, others in the future may not have to go through some of the same uh, crushing failures uh, that military institutions in the past have had, uh, which is often linked left to national failure, not just military failure. It is a book about change in many respects. Um, we're seeing another um, industrial revolution play out around us, uh, but we've seen three of these before, you know, first industrial revolution um, from the 1790s onwards, um, the second industrial revolution from the 1890s onwards, the third industrial revolution after the second world war, all of these had profound societal impacts. And then these flowed into uh, transformations in how military forces thought about themselves and their relationship with their nations, how they designed their organisations and how they equipped themselves and indeed how they fought during wars. So this book was trying to pull all that together and then produce um, a bit of a design for 21st century military institutions whose core idea was that uh, it is not technologies that will provide us with the decisive advantages in the 21st century because these are now largely a level playing field. It is the uh, clever integration of um, new ideas, new organisations and new ways of training and educating our people that will be at the heart of 21st century uh, military advantage. I think uh, there's a couple of things I hope people might take away from the book. Firstly, that um, they understand not everything's changing. There's a lot of continuity uh, in warfare and in strategic competition. Um, you know, some of these continuities include that humans remain competitive. Human nature is not changing. It just isn't. Um, and things such as fear, honour, interest still are very important in national and international relations. Um, another thing that's not changing is war and competition are not going away. Um, we will continue to need clever strategies and good military forces. Um, and a third continuity is surprise. We will continue to be surprised either uh, in a technological sense or uh, through wars. And indeed, tech, um, democracies have mastered the art of being surprised by different wars, although I would say that the Ukraine war hasn't come as a terrible surprise to anyone, or if it has, um, they haven't been doing much in the last couple of years to see what's going on in the world. Um, and another thing I hope people might take away is that um, the real resource that we haven't valued over the last 20 years and we really need to focus on is time. Democracies are, are very good at using 24-hour uh, cycles, news cycles, and they're very good at using three to four-year electoral cycles. But outside of that, uh, we have some profound problems in appreciating using time. Democracies need to be better at using microseconds and at using decades. In microseconds, we're seeing algorithms and hypersonic weapons that might change the pace of tactical operations significantly, and we need to understand that although we're not seeing that play out in this war in Ukraine, and we can talk about that momentarily. But we also need to be better at using decades. Uh, we are in a new kind of Cold War with China uh, and a new long-term strategic competition with China and Russia. These things need clever policy, they need clever strategy, but they also need governments who can build societal patience and the ability of societies to contribute to these long-term competitions. Um, so the third thing I hope people might take away is this, this 
21st century trinity of new ideas, new organisations and new ways of developing people as the source of military advantage. Um, this is a really important construct because although we've seen the Russians and Chinese come up with new hypotheses about war and even some new organisations, um, we've also seen some of these hypotheses get tested in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, Russian active defence and they're yet to be proven. And it may well be the same with some of these new Chinese ideas. The same is true with some of their organisations. Clearly, Russian battalion tactical groups may have worked in smaller scenarios, but when it comes to large scale conventional operations where you want to focus on manoeuvre um, and less on attrition, uh, they have been found wanting. But I think also in democracies, the uh, new ideas and new ways of developing people is our real strength because in authoritarian regimes, um, they can't consider every new idea. Some of them are highly threatening to the regimes that want to stay in power. And our superpower in democracies is being able to consider the widest array of options for every problem we might face. So that's that's what I hope people might take away from the book. Um, clearly, it has um, provided an intellectual framework for me to look at what we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment, as well as the international reaction to that. I mean, we, we have to be able to look both within the borders of Ukraine at the military strategy and, and tactical operations, uh, but also beyond Ukraine's borders for the strategy that Putin's cho chosen, which Friedman has called a delusional strategy, and it's hard to disagree with that, uh, but also the construction of this international arsenal de of democracy, which is providing both humanitarian and international aid for Ukraine at the moment. Um, I think the result is still very much open in Ukraine. Um, the Russians are doing quite well in the southern theatre. In fact, that'll be the subject of my tweet today. In the northern and eastern areas, it really has settled into a grinding war of attrition, um, which the Russians actually aren't doing well at at the moment, although they do have a much larger force. So the outcome, I think, remains uh, unclear at this point in time. I don't think there's any... Um, uh, you know, certainty that the Russians will totally overrun Ukraine, although there's a, a better than even chance of that. Uh, but, you know, the Ukrainians have fought extraordinarily well. Um, and I think this comes down to uh, many things, but at heart it is about a sense of purpose. Uh, the Ukrainians have a strong sense of purpose. They know what democracy and freedom's like. The Russians can't give them that, and they know it's worth fighting for. None of the Russians who have come across the border from general down to private soldier appear to share a similar sense of driving purpose. Um, so that's all I'd like to say as part of my introductory re uh, remarks, and I'm happy to uh, jump into a discussion, Ian. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, sir. And we got questions already stacking up in the, the chat, so I want to make sure I get to those. Um, I would just like to to maybe offer a uh, a couple of questions sort of to bridge from the framework of your book into, you know, current events and then to some of the specific questions that we're getting here right now. So, you know, you, you talked about how you were, uh, the book aims to produce sort of a framework where looking at changes unique in the 21st century and then as well a design for 21st century institutions to, you know, sort of how they use some of those changes, both from the industrial revolution, but also the, you know, integrating new, new ideas, new, new personal, you know, or talent management, as we're calling it in the Marine Corps, but, you know, use of the people. How, how have you seen that framework um, exploited or not exploited um, on, on both what you've been seeing on the Ukrainian and Russian sides thus far the last couple of weeks? Well, I think the Russians tried to be imaginative um, and maneuverist in the first 48 hours, but that use of light forces, particularly in the north and east, to seize key points uh, was based on a strategy that assumed the Ukrainians would cower and fall in the face of massed Russian forces. Uh, that didn't happen. And every time the Russians have chosen to piecemeal light and, and midweight forces into these kind of coup de main operations, which is part of the military doctrine, they have not done well. They've then fallen back, I think, into a more ad hoc approach, which 
um, I think could be described as their traditional firepower heavy um, attritional approach. Uh, it's what Russian forces, I think, have in their deep historical military culture. Um, but it's not working well either because the Russians, even with 200,000, is not a big force. Remember, the Ukrainians also have a pretty large military of nearly 200,000. Um, you know, it's it's hard to see how any of these new age Russian doctrinal ideas have been proven successful so far. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, um, yeah, I got a lot of questions coming in, so I wanna make sure we, we get to those um, as much as we can. So uh, first one I have is from, I'm sorry, let me get back to the top here, from Trevor Garmy. And he's asking that uh, one takeaway he's seen is that if we're using U.S. military ter terminology, the Ukrainian military seems to have merged Comstrat and information operations and deployed IO at a tactical level that both furthers their political and military objectives. How do you see this affecting future planning among the U.S. and its specific allies potentially? Yeah. No, no, this has been a Ukrainian strong point, although I don't have a lot of patience for a lot of these silly doctrinal divisions in the conduct of influence operations. I, I actually don't find them very helpful. Um, at, at heart, all war is about um, violence and influence. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. And regardless of what we want to call it, the Ukrainians have leveraged social media and very strong leadership from their president to generate influence inside their own country to unify their people and generate international influence that has built this international coalition that is supporting the Ukrainians. Um, it, is a, it is an amazing case study in how the entire world, with the exception of China um, and a couple of other countries, have now come behind Ukraine and said things and done things that were unimaginable even two weeks ago. I mean, Germany's turnaround in defence spending and declarations about defending democracy beyond its borders were literally unimaginable two weeks ago. But um, through the power of social media, through internet connectivity and clever use of the media, the Ukrainian president, who, remember, was kind of written off a while ago as a, as a former comedian, he has done a superb job as a national leader. And the combination of influence operations and good leadership um, remain a very, very important part of warfare. All right, thanks, sir. And actually, the next question is from Trevor as well. And it's another focusing on the, the Pacific area. Uh, would you agree with assessments that uh, Xi has in some ways jumped the gun on his 100-year marathon by alerting the U.S., Australia, China, I'm sorry, Japan, and Republic of Korea to China's long-term intentions and therefore given us an opportunity to potentially meaningfully counter their efforts to establish a, a classic sphere of influence, provided we can start thinking in the same terms and sort of, as you said, you know, looking decades, uh, you know, to, to the 2055 time frame rather than, you know, 2022 or 2023. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's always been this myth that the Chinese are master strategists. I've, I've never really bought into it because they're humans like everyone else and make mistakes. Um, and we don't see a lot of their mistakes. So there's been this myth grow up in the strategic community over 40 or 50 years. Um, but if there was ever anything to it, President Xi has busted that in the last two years. I mean, he's literally made every wrong step when it comes to strategy for guiding his country through the challenges of the 21st century. He's destroyed any source of diverse opinion that can test different strategies and come up with clever strategies for China in the 21st century. He has bullied nations into siding with uh, the United States and other countries in the West when they may not have been inclined to two years ago. Um, you know, he has sought to economically coerce countries that weren't, were nowhere near as economically vulnerable, despite their trade ties with China, as Xi thought. Um, you know, he is a new style leader uh, for China, whereas his predecessors have generally been built up strength quietly. Um, he's built it up loudly and in a way that has united uh, the Western Pacific against him. 
um, very much the same way that Putin has with his invasion of Ukraine. I mean, Putin, in one respect, could call masterful because he's united the West and changed how the West sees its defence of democracy in a way that just hasn't been possible in the last 20 years. I mean, people will study the absolute delusion and strategic idiocy of Putin's invasion of Ukraine for a long time to come. Uh, Xi, with an invasion, a potential invasion of Taiwan, would probably achieve something similar, although an invasion of Taiwan, and I'm, I'm writing a book on that at the moment, is an infinitely more difficult task for a Chinese military that has nowhere near the operational experience that the Russians have. So actually, in that vein, sir, before I get to the next question from the audience here, um, you know, the the Z sort of bursting his own his own myth in the last couple of years um, and then looking at, you know, Russian operations and they're um, they, they just have not been good in like so so many so many respects that, that it surprised everyone. You know, it's really uh, challenged a lot of assumptions about, um, you know, about what they can do. So just are, are there any any assumptions maybe about, you know, the Chinese, uh, as you mentioned, it's some of the political expansion or some Chinese military capabilities that maybe we should revisit based on what we've been seeing uh, the Russian military do? I think the first and most important one is how good are they at strategy? I mean, the heart of the Russian problems at the moment is what Friedman has called this delusional strategy out of Putin, which has a couple of parts. You know, Ukraine is a non-state. Uh, Ukraine is a nation that won't fight. The West as a group of countries that are on decline and won't support Ukraine. Um, he's been disproven in all three. And the military planning uh, and all their mistakes since the invasion all track back to that. And I've got to be quite frank, it's pretty clear to me that senior military commanders from Russia, those who are in charge of the northern, eastern and southern fronts, except the possible ex uh, exclusion of the southern front commanders, I don't know what they did during the build-up. They clearly didn't do a lot of wargaming. They clearly didn't do a lot of planning. And any planning they appear to have done has been all best case. I mean, what a bunch of professionally corrupt military commanders who are now operating in the most unethical way that we can imagine by deliberately targeting civilians. Yeah, definitely agree with all that. All right, uh, thanks, sir. We'll go back to the questions here in the chat. Next one is from actually one of our non-resident fellows through the Kulak Center, um, Sergeant Chris Ellis of the New Zealand Army, who's who's up with you in the Monday morning timeframe. Uh, so Chris, good to see you. And his question for you is, how do you think we can better create and capture value from our failures and their associated lessons learned? Do you think we ever will or ever should penalize leaders in performance reviews for a lack of failure or excessive risk aversion so that we nudge organizational culture more towards calculated risk taking to enhance our their agility and adaptability? I think it's an important question. I mean, most military training is actually founded on failure. Uh, we, we train people to the point of failure and then just over in a safe environment because we know failure is the best teacher. And if you can teach people in a safe environment and design failure into your training, um, you know, that's really important. I mean, it's, I did that as a battalion commander. I did it as a brigade commander and I did it as the designer of three exercise hamels, which is our major army exercise in a row. We designed in um, testing brigades to failure. Uh, but that's no good if you have a strategic leadership that has a zero risk mentality or doesn't demonstrate the capacity to learn from failure. Um, you know, I, I think the response to um, the alleged uh, killings, by our, our special forces people in Afghanistan is a good example of this. I don't know that we have fully learned from that at this point in time. Certainly some of the strategic narrative is, you know, we, we've known about this, we've fixed it and it's time to look to the future. Uh, that's not the case. Um, there needs to be an open accounting and senior leader accountability and acceptance of responsibility that we may not have seen to the degree that we, we need to really internalise the lessons of, of what happened there. Um, every military institution, I think, over the last decade has 
had problems with accepting um, strategic failure, I think it would be the best term in Afghanistan and learning from it. So we have a long way to go at the highest levels of accepting failure and learning from it. Yeah, definitely seeing that on, on my end too. In our, in our organization, we try, but it's uh, there's a long way to go. Um, before the next question in the chat, actually, if I'm wondering if you could uh, maybe jump off a little bit, sir, on the, the sort of in stride agility or adaptation. I know you've been, you know, tweeting a lot about what you've been seeing, but for our audience, if you could maybe summarize some some of the adaptations you've seen, both the Ukrainian or Russian forces, if they've done any since the war started, from how it's been conducted through today. It's hard to make detailed observations in some respects because, I mean, it, it's war, right? And we all know that you don't get the full picture, particularly in real time. We're probably seeing 10% of what's happening. Um, uh, you add to that Ukrainian operational security, in my view, appears to have been particularly effective. Um, so we're not seeing their successful adaptations. Um, but we can surmise um firstly that the ukrainians have just demonstrated good uh competent military leadership and good combined arms skills uh, but they've also demonstrated a really good capacity to place their strength where the russians are weak and avoid russian strengths um, and whether that's attacking logistic convoys or destroying light forces with me mechanized forces um you know, destroying regiments of towed artillery with ML MLRS. This is just the basics of our profession that the Ukrainians have demonstrated that they are much better at than the Russians. Um, so being good at the basics is 90% of winning in war. You know, just be better at the basics than the other person. The other 10% is looking around, learning and adapting to a better quality and in some instances faster than the adversary. You know, and I, I think the Ukrainians have demonstrated the capacity to uh, respond more quickly to what the Russians are doing. Um, but, you know, it, it's early days yet. We're, we're not even two weeks into this and there will be voluminous studies of both forces in the coming months, uh, years and decades. It will be really interesting on this point. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I think I saw on Twitter the last couple of days, someone noted if every bill, every military officer out there better be had taking, you know, giant green notebooks full of notes from what they've been seeing. And uh, and I'm, I'm sure many of them have. OK, yeah, I think we both know, Ian, that probably 25 percent are. Yeah, I was trying to be optimistic, but um, at least at least some are. Yeah. Uh, OK, I'll go back to the to the questions here in the chat. So uh, another from Trevor Garmy asking, if you've been surprised by the fact that's the coup de main operations, and I assume he's been talking about, you know, both kind of the general thunder runs down toward Kiev, as well as by my last count, three attempted assassination attempts against the Ukrainian president. Uh, uh, he's asking, have, have the, why have these not been preceded by at any time by forced neutralization efforts in the vicinity of the target? Yeah, I mean, I actually haven't been surprised by the lack of success of these because historically we've seen them as not always delivering success either. I mean, geez, didn't the Russians watch a bridge too far? I mean, what kind of idiotic military commander drops a small parachute force in the vicinity of motorized and mechanized enemy forces who were defending their home ground? I mean, you know, it, it's hard to believe the arrogance of that and just the sheer incompetence of the planning that goes into those kind of operations. Now, I know in the Russian military system, their airborne forces are, are supposedly elite, um, uh, have a lot of privileges that other soldiers don't have. But I gotta tell you, the Russians better relook at this after this war because they haven't delivered in this war um, and they haven't acted like an elite force. In fact, they've acted like a bunch of entitled thugs who've delivered loss after loss for the Russians. Um, I think there has been a lot of arrogance in the senior military leadership and the strategic leadership in Russia. And, and frankly, I'll just go back to this time in uh, rehearsal is never wasted. You know, what were the Russians doing for those months when they were sitting around in camps on the periphery of Ukraine? I mean, I don't know that they were thinking about worst case or war gaming, what could happen when their initial plans don't work. 
So in that line, sir, actually, um, you know, another theme that's been coming out a lot on the sort of social media assessment so far is, is exactly on that question is what were they doing in all those months? And uh, it's been reflected in noting things as basic as like not moving your vehicles around so the tires don't rot. Um, what, uh, I, I guess, what, what do you make of the, you, like the, the basic, like the, you know, blocking and tackling is, you know, some people like to call it over here or those, but just those fundamentals, um, how, how did they, how, why do you think they didn't like do any of that most basic stuff, like telling a corporal to move, you know, move the truck every now and then? Um, yeah. what, what I mean, there's, there's been some interesting speculation on this, um, you know, I, once again, I think this goes back originally to bad strategy where they assumed uh, the Ukrainians would roll over. So they weighted the 190,000 towards combat forces and not enough towards logistic forces. But I mean, we also need to uh, have a little humility here. We have all been on exercises and operations where logistics have been problematic, right? All of our training systems teach our combat leaders to be highly aggressive in the offensive and, and during the advance. And sometimes that means good, aggressive, successful combat leaders in the advance outrun their logistics. Uh, we've seen that all through history. Um, you know, uh, Patton did it over and over again. And 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 we look at him as a, as a great and aggressive military leader. Uh, the Germans in their invasion of France in May 1940, uh, you know, it was described as a 250 kilometer traffic jam. So, you know, logistics problems are part and parcel of large scale military operations. But there also seems to be something else at play here, um, which is a combination of a Russian reliance on civilian logistics at home, uh, something my country does and would concern me. Um, but just some of the basic training, you know, looking after your vehicles and, and, and those kind of core skills, you know, that once again, brilliant at the basics that they seem to have missed here. You know, in some respects, we've overestimated Russian military capacity and you can't just assess capacity on number of tanks, number of fighters and number of artillery systems. The humans and the brains in those humans really are the core of military capability. And, uh, you know, the Ukrainians have outthought and outfought the Russians at most steps of the game here. Yeah, and in that line, um, I've, I've the, under the Krulak Center, we've been running a couple of different wargaming initiatives, sort of looking as this conflict was potentially building up and then executing. But one thing that's kind of sort of come out of both is how do you how do you model incompetence? Like how do you build that into the game system? Because we uh, one thing um, initial scenario I ran a few weeks back was. Uh, it was on southern Ukraine, and it featured a combined amphibious and air assault force to try and do some some efforts. And they were bloody, but they they sort of at least got their initial objectives. And then as this unfolded, we were like, we we over we overestimated we overplayed the competence of what they would do. Um, so yeah, we're, we're 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 sort of struggling to figure out how to how do you dumb down the opponent in in a game to make sure that it reflects what they can you know, if they underperform. Uh, anyway, I'm monologuing now. So I'll go on to the next question. Uh, from Albert Lee, he's asking in the information domain, the impression he has is that Ukraine and its allies have been willing to go on the offensive in the information domain and have done so effectively, unlike how the U.S. ceded it in Syria. What do you think of NATO's strategic communication efforts in support of Ukraine to date? Yeah, I mean, I think Syria is not a great case study for the US because its vital national interests probably weren't engaged there. Um, so it, it probably wasn't as focused on it as some might have liked. Um, the reality is all our vital national interests are engaged in Ukraine because this is about um, defending a, a democratic country. Uh, that is at the heart of what we should be doing as democracies. Um, I also think we're probably better at it than we give ourselves credit for because we are all every day used to operating in a very open information environment in democracies um, and in many, many countries and in, at least in some militaries, uh, military officers are encouraged to debate, uh, talk freely about ideas. Clearly the Russians don't have this environment and if you can't and are not nurtured to operate in the information environment peacetime, you're not just suddenly gonna get better at it. 
uh, in wartime. I mean, this is at the heart of why I've always been a fan of get military officers on social media. Um, learn about the interaction and the free play of the information environment so you can operate in it when it really matters. Um, you know, I've made it mandatory in all my commands that everyone's on it. I don't care if they don't like it. Uh, we also don't like budgeting and uh, some elements of logistics, but it's still essential. And so is participation in the information environment. Uh, you know, any Western military that doesn't uh, encourage its leaders at every single level to be on social media, to learn about it, to participate in it, and most importantly, learn how to be influencers in peace and war is probably not going to be successful in the future. The Russians haven't. Yeah, so actually that's, that's been something else we've been thinking about a lot lately, which is uh, how how do you, you mentioned you've done it in your units, but in, in, in Western, and I'm also thinking American military units as a whole, it looks like the Ukrainians have really sort of cracked the code on effective, I'll call it tactical TikTok for lack of a better term, like down to the lowest level, you know, the lowest corporal or private, they are, it's not just letting them, but they seem, there seems to be a tacit encouragement to use it, to maximize it, to get your lower level message out. And then it syncs up with sort of the, you know, the strategic and then the national level, level messages where, you know, you, the lowest level might be burned out tanks and the highest level is the president uh, giving his daily Zoom calls. But the point is everybody's doing it at every level. And mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a top to bottom, left to right um, immersion in the information environment that uh, at, at least on on the U.S. side we simply don't see. Um, mm -hmm. What do you? What other concrete things do you think we could do to to try and approach that level of of fusion that they've achieved in using different media messaging platforms and letting letting and encouraging their soldiers do mm -hmm. it. Yeah, they're clearly uh, engaging in mission command when it comes to that, as well as their combat operations, which, you know, is wonderful to see. I, I have no doubt that there's some guidance there, particularly on what not to tweet, you know, <laughs> you know locations and, and operational capabilities, strengths and, and those kind of things or, or you know, uh, future operations. But, you know, they may have been given those and then the rest of it just have at it. Um, although, you know, how many of the videos we're seeing are from civilians uh, rather than military uh, would also be an interesting question to us. But I'm pretty much guarantee that most Rush, um, Ukrainian military leaders don't have um, a civilian bureaucracy in a defence headquarters having 50 committee meetings every day to try and decide how they can stop soldiers tweeting pics. Um, they've probably been given some guidance and then they've cracked on with it. And that's the kind of mindset we need to build during peacetime. We can't afford these highly, highly bureaucratized approaches to uh, strategic influence operations. We do need to align messages, but the centralization, uh, the risk aversion to allowing subordinate people to engage in this environment and the bureaucratization uh, from non-military people has to end. We, we just can't be successful in the 21st century in the ways we're doing it at the moment. Yeah, I, th I think among many things, how they've achieved that with their forces is something that we'll need to study very closely uh, in the years to come. All right, back to, so Trevor Garmy's got another question for you, sir. He's asking about uh, looking at future planning now in Europe. Do you see the U.S. looking at stationing, and I realize this is a U.S. focused question, but I'll still ask it to you. Do you see the U.S. looking to station more permanent forces or pushing Europe to add more assets while increasing the size of pre-positioned depots in Eastern Europe and the frequency of rehearsals, such as the old Reforger series from the late Cold War? Uh, I hope not. Uh, in short, uh, let's let Germany step up. You know, this is uh, the largest economy in Europe. It has massive military potential and Germany as the core of a European um, military organization should be something that the US would find highly desirable. It doesn't mean there can't be uh, US bases and forces there, but the core of European defence should be European. It should be funded by the Europeans. Uh, it should be commanded, you know, in coordination with the United States. 
But, you know, frankly, Russia is not the biggest problem the United States and the world faces. The biggest problem we have is China, um, not just in what they want to do in their own country, but what they want to do outside of their country. Um, it is the biggest and most difficult challenge the United States has ever faced in its history. I mean, Nazi Germany and Japan are nothing compared to the military, economic and informational potential of China. Um, allowing the Europeans to fund their own defence, uh, given that, you know, the combined European economies and military potential is vastly, vastly greater than Russia. And they have new, two nuclear powers, France and the UK, and they, there's no reason after this the Europeans really can't uh, grip up their destiny when it comes to the defence of their continent. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly been a huge sea change in what they've uh, what they've stepped up to do in the last you know couple of weeks. But it's very interesting to see if that sticks in the long run. Um, so speaking of China, uh, Chris Ellis has got another question for you, focusing us back on the Pacific, asking what your thoughts are on the seeming unique, unique excuse me unique role of the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation plays in both deterring China's aggression toward Taiwan and ensuring U.S. support due, their, due to their monopoly on advanced semiconductors. Uh, if you view that company is important to Taiwan security, do you think this has been developed by accident or by design? Uh, I think there was probably no grand design when it was established decades ago, but it is a strategically important company uh, with a strategically important capability. Um, remember, it manufactures, uh, but it's the Dutch who build the best lithographing machines that make these highly advanced uh, semiconductors in, in Taiwan and other places. Uh, TMSC uh, has four or five major manufacturing sites in the north and in central parts of Taiwan. It is also investing billions of dollars to uh, um, build a new fabrication facility in the continental United States as well. Um, it would be a key target for the Chinese to seize and it would be a key uh, reserve demolition for Taiwanese engineers in, in any campaign. Because remember, it's not the fabrication facility, it's the intellectual property that's really important here. Um, and I can, you know, I can't guarantee, but I could speculate that the Taiwanese have pretty good offshore data center uh, protection of the IP that's inherent uh, in TMSC. All right, thanks, sir. Uh, okay, another question from, uh, let me get back here, from Albert Lee. So this is shifting back into uh, information operations in your own time with the ADF. In your time there, did you meet anyone uh, or did you yourself work or train with Ukrainians on their peacetime operation or peacetime information operations? Uh, I'm not aware of anyone doing it. It doesn't mean they haven't. Uh, I'd be surprised if at least some, someone in the organisation hasn't done it. Um, I'm only aware of one article written here about lessons from the previous uh, conflict in Ukraine. That was me in 2014. Um, I don't think Ukraine has been high on our radar, unfortunately, with the exception of the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner several years ago, and you know, 35 Australians and, and hundreds of others were killed on that. It just hasn't captured the strategic Im imagination here. It's seen as a as a Russian, European, and, and American problem, and we should be more focused on our region. That said, there are just a multitude of lessons already that we might take from this, and they're going to take some analysis, and they're going to take some uh, careful collection of evidence over the coming weeks and months, uh, because social media isn't always the best evidence for a lesson learned. Uh, but this is going to be a terrific campaign for us to all study. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, to the audience, uh, I'll ask if you have any last questions, throw them in the chat because we are approaching uh, the top of the new hour here. And I know General Ryan's got it. Okay, we got one uh, to start his day. So we'll, we'll do a couple more and then we'll, we'll close it out here at right about an hour. So from Trevor Garmy, going back to information operations, Looking at the scale of Taiwan, again, you know, it presents a lot of challenges. Uh, twice the size of Okinawa, took the U.S. nearly 50,000 casualties, um, taking it outright, and that was with air and naval supremacy. China won't have that, likely, if they did try and launch an invasion. Uh, likely, they will take tremendous casualties just getting there. 
So how can we, uh, how would we prepare to penetrate China's firewalls if they moved on this, um, to sharing the realities of any invasion with its population? So I guess similar to the, what Ukraine has been doing in showing images back to the Russian people about what's actually going on, how would we do that through the Chinese Great Firewall, since that's a pretty robust defensive capability? Yeah, I mean, I, I recommend the Battle of Okinawa to everyone as a great case study. In fact, I reread Robert Leckie's book uh, on the Battle of Okinawa over Christmas, just because I think it's so relevant to the situation that we might face. I mean, Okinawa is important for a whole range of reasons, not just because it's a, an island in the Western Pacific. Yes, about 60,000 killed and wounded in, in the US Army, US Navy, US Marine Corps uh, during that pretty bloody campaign, but also uh, 36 US Navy ships sunk and 350 damaged. I mean, let that sink in for a moment. What's the size of the US Navy battle force at the moment? Um, and that was because the Japanese developed a precision uh, ship attack weapon called the Kamikaze. Um, and after that, the US started to relook at its campaign for Japan. It had a strategic impact and impacted on the decision to drop the atomic bomb because they figured out that if the Japanese resisted like this in Okinawa, uh, an invasion of uh, the southern parts of Japan and then the Tokyo plane would just, you know, probably up to a million casualties. Um, and at that point in the war, even the US was just not keen on that. So I, I recommend everyone study this campaign because Ukraine will be worse. Sorry, not Ukraine, uh, Taiwan would be much worse for both countries. I mean, if you study the geography, you know, the old Maku of Taiwan, it's a, it's a large island with a central mountain range, you know, a western coastal plain. It's 180 kilometres from China, whereas the, uh, you know, the uh, English Channel's 22 miles. Uh, just getting the number of forces the Chinese need across that ditch is a massive, massive challenge. I don't think they're up to it. And I certainly don't think they're up to it when the Taiwanese and the Americans probably have a game plan to sink the PLA Navy on the first day of the battle. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> I yeah. just say, right, you want to use your Navy? We're going to take it away from you. Yeah, I, in fact, the, uh, when we, we ran a very, um, very simplified uh, scenario for that as part of our wargaming tournament last year. Um, and that's what the, the U S team did. Um, they took a big gamble. They went all in on sinking the amphibs and the Navy and, uh, and they did it. So um, I'm sure that'll be part of it. So um, I get no more questions in the chat. I got one more for you, sir. And then we'll let you start your day. Uh, I'm sorry. There is one last one. And then last one for me, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So from Albert Lee again, um, asking at some point in the coming decades, there will probably be an operation or at probably more than one operational level history of this war published. Um, what would you, what would you want to see in it? And do you think the current Russian military leadership will live to write about it from their side? Um, you know, I would go back first to the great Wick Murray quote where, um, you know, you can recover from tactical failures, but strategic failures live forever. Um, first and foremost, that has to be the lesson of this war, that um, bad strategy, bad national strategy uh, has an impact on everything that follows. I think that's a really important lesson. Um, secondly, the military design for the uh, invasion and conquest of a country you know, it has to integrate a whole range of things that don't appear to have been integrated here. I mean, geez, they were so arrogant. They went in without achieving air control. I mean, the Russian Air Force is massive and at least in theory, very competent, although there's been some analysis in the last few days that suggests it's not as competent as we'd like, although I don't know we need analysis to tell us that at the moment. Um, and then the integration of ground forces whether it's the integration of conventional and special operations, whether it's combined arms operations, uh, whether it's the integration of kinetic and non-kinetic effects of military operation, all these things will need to be studied in detail. And, and frankly, two weeks ago, the vast majority of people assumed the Russians were really good at all this stuff, uh, but war is the ultimate test of leadership and military capability, and the Russians have been found wanting in just about all of them. 
You're good. Thanks, sir. All right, my last question for you, and then uh, then we'll be good. Um, so you mentioned that your your next uh, Twitter thread is going to be focused on the Southern Theater, um, and I'm actually very interested to read that because I've I've been wargaming some parts of that myself the last several days. But can you maybe give kind of a preview of some of the the things you've seen down there? Um, because it it has seemed to be somewhat more successful in in achieving objectives than any of the other thrusts. Well, I think, you know, it, because it's not uh, the main theatre of the war, clearly the main theatre is the north and east. Um, the Ukrainians have um, played it as an, or not quite an economy of force mission, but they haven't allocated the density of forces there uh, that they have in the north and the east. Um, also, you know, the Russians are much better placed logistically to surge out of Crimea and southern Russia than they are surging out of Belarus, which is a temporary operating location, whereas Crimea and Rostov, for example, are long-standing uh, military concentrations and logistic hubs. So they're probably getting better support there. A and there's been no interference from the sea. I mean, the Ukraine doesn't have a significant navy. You know, it has some old patrol boats and old, old destroyers and amphibious vessels. But the Russians in their uh, land, sea, integration seem to have been better in the south than they have been at air land integration in the north. And last last sort of sub question on that is, you know, there's been a lot of focus and concern, obviously, about a potential amphibious operation somewhere in the environs of Odessa, although it seems to have been postponed or or called off a couple of times, sort of unclear what it might be, you know, whether it's weather, there have been some rumors, which I'm not sure how much we can credit them, that some of the sailor or the, the naval infantry don't want to go. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how much credence I put in that one. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I think that the naval infantry, at least in the past, were looked at at a little bit higher cut than your average force. But based on what we've been seeing in the acid test of combat the last couple of weeks, uh, do you think they could successfully do a uh, a large amphibious landing, especially given every day they don't do it, the uh, the local population defense forces at Odessa are building in defenses. Yeah, I mean, it all depends on where you land, right? It's, it's the same old story with amphibious operations. If you can pull it off unopposed, that's way better than having to do an opposed amphibious landing. I mean, even the Marines now look at opposed landings and go, well, you know, unopposed sounds pretty good, even even with everything we bring to the table. Now, if the Russians are able to get ashore unopposed, uh, secure a beachhead line and a and a concentration that they can then break out of, they'll they'll certainly be in good shape. Uh, but as we all know, uh, if you're the defender, it's pretty easy to do an appreciation of the best landing beaches that have the best routes away uh, towards projective objectives. There won't actually be that many beaches. So the Ukrainians, as they have so far, probably have done their appreciation of the situation uh, reasonably well. Um, I, I would say the Russians are, are thinking about this might have to be an opposed landing. And can we do this without kind of without some kind of tactical disaster? Yeah, if, if uh, you know, based on their performance, if I were them, I'm not sure I'd want to roll the dice on that at this point. Um, OK, well, I think uh, we're going to end right about an hour here, sir. So. Um, happy to let you have any final comments or thoughts before we we call it a day. And firstly, thanks everyone. Uh, it's been great to talk to you. I mean, I think you all know my love for the Marines and and the great uh, time I had in my two years at Quantico at Staff College and SOAR. So thank you for uh, reinvigorating that relationship today. But these conversations are really important. Uh, we need to watch what's going on in Ukraine. There are so many lessons from both sides that we can all learn. Um, but also remember, uh, collect evidence for the lessons as well. Don't just use single source TikTok feeds uh, to inform our military learning. Yeah, that, I, I expect lots of learning from this, from lots of sources in the years to come. Um, all right, sir, on behalf of the Krulak Center and myself, thank you very much for joining us on, on pretty short notice. I've been, I've been uh, dragooning a lot of people in here on short notice lately, but I think it's important that we get a lot of you know, very informed perspectives because, you know, unfortunately we're, we're, we're watching more in the 21st century unfold in real time. So 
Um, we can't ignore it, so we might as well do our best to try and learn from it and, uh, and gain what insights we can to help ourselves in the future. So I, I appreciate your flexibility. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, to the rest of our audience, thanks for joining us for a weekend broadcast. And uh, we're going to keep doing these at sort of the fastest rate I can put them together so we can, again, bring more perspectives in to help us better understand what's going on in Ukraine right now. So the next one we have actually is going to be on Friday morning. Eastern time at 730. We're very pleased to have with us Dr. Matthew Ford and Professor Andrew Hoskins, who have a forthcoming book on information or uh, really it's war, um, war looking at information operations from kind of the social media aspect we've already talked about. So Friday morning, please join us. Uh, they'll be talking about war in the age of the smartphone, and we will have more of these to follow as well in the days and weeks to come. So, sir, thank you again. Have a good day to our audience. Have a good night. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, everyone. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.